Thank you, Father. And um, I was going to say to everybody who's viewing, thank you for being here or uh, being here virtually. In case you're wondering, it's not cold here in Los Angeles. That's not why I'm wearing a coat. Since this is a what would otherwise be a public lecture, I thought it would be appropriate that I would dress in my usual quasi-formal style. Um, if I understand correctly, um, you should find on the YouTube uh, description of the lecture a link to an outline of the talk, which looks like this. And I just thought it would be helpful for people to have uh, in front of them as, as I speak here uh, as a little roadmap to the talk. Um, so the, the, the talk is on the metaphysics of the will, and I've broken it down into six sections. Um, an introduction and then a discussion of substances and their powers then rational substances specifically. And then I originally had a, a fourth section on voluntarism against voluntarism. It turns out because of the strict time constraints we're under, we're gonna wrap things up here in an hour, but I'll skip that section now and then move on to section five, freedom of choice. And then a final section six that you'll see in the outline on what I call the post-mortem fixity of the will. So that's the plan of the talk, and I'll, I'll get through, apart from that section on voluntarism, I'll get through as much of it as we have time for. So uh, I'll go ahead and get into it then. Uh, the connection between metaphysics and ethics is nowhere more clear or direct than where questions about the nature of the will arise. For it is all and only creatures with wills who can intelligibly be said to be subject to moral praise or blame. And it's only by understanding the metaphysics of the will that we can see why that is the case. Moreover, there may be no area where bad metaphysics has caused greater damage to moral theory and practice than where errors about the nature of the will are concerned. The most uh, obvious and commonly cited example would be the thesis that free will is an illusion, the truth of which would undermine the very possibility of morality. But Thomas would cite other examples too, albeit ones that are bound to be more controversial. There is, for example, the voluntarist thesis that the intellect is subordinate to the will, which Thomists take to have irrationalist implications. There is the related thesis that the will's freedom consists in freedom of indifference toward the various ends that it might pursue, rather than freedom for excellence or the freedom to pursue the good, the cited distinction emphasized by Servius Pinkers. And related to that error is yet another one, according to which freedom of the will is incompatible with the theological truth, which, as I'll argue, is also a philosophical truth, that the wills of the blessed in heaven are forever fixed on God, and the wills of the damned are forever fixed on evil, a truth the rejection of which is bound to have dire consequences for moral theology. These errors are rooted in more fundamental metaphysical errors. For example, there is a tendency to hypostasize the will, to treat it as if it were something like a substance in its own right, rather than a power of a rational substance. This tendency reflects a blindness to the unity of the human person that has followed upon modern philosophy's abandonment of the notion of substantial form. Modern philosophy also abandoned the notion of natural teleology and with it, any possibility of seeing the will as naturally directed toward the good. Then there is the materialist denial of the immateriality of the intellect and of the will, which is a necessary condition of the will's being free. Even philosophers who would avoid these errors often fall into yet others. For example, they suppose that the way that an immaterial mind secures free will is by virtue of being a Cartesian res cogitans that interferes with other, otherwise causally determined bodily processes. Or they suppose that the wills being fixed on good or evil after death is to be reconciled with free will by adopting compatibilism. The best way to clear up such errors is to take things back to first principles and then work them forward again. The will is one of the powers of a rational substance, whether a human being or an angel, and a rational substance is, of course, a kind of substance. So it will be useful to begin by considering what it is to be a substance in general, what it is to be a power of a substance. Then we can consider what it is to be a rational substance specifically. The true nature of the will qua power of a rational substance will be revealed by this way of proceeding, which is, I think, more or less Aquinas's way. In particular, it will be evident that the intellect is prior to the will, that the will is free, and that it is naturally directed toward what the intellect perceives to be good. Other aspects of human action will 
also be illuminated, such as the role that the circumstances a rational substance finds itself in play in determining what is willed. It will become clear exactly how the errors that I referred to arise from neglect of one or another part of the metaphysical story that I'll be telling. Okay, so much by way of introduction. So now let me get into what I've got listed there on the handout of section two uh, on substances and their powers. One way to understand what a substance is, is to contrast it with what it is not. A substance is not an attribute, nor an aggregate, nor an artifact. For example, redness is an attribute rather than a substance insofar as it exists only in other things, in an apple say, or in a stop sign, whereas a substance does not exist in another thing in the same sense. It has a kind of independence that an attribute lacks. A pile of stones is an aggregate rather than a substance insofar as there's really nothing over and above the sum of the stones that make it up, each of which would be exactly as it is whether or not it was part of the pile. A substance has a kind of unity that an aggregate lacks, insofar as it is more than the sum of its parts, each of which is what it is, only relative to the whole of which it is a part. A watch is an artifact rather than a substance, insofar as its characteristic time-telling function is observer-relative, something imposed on it from outside by the designers and the users of the watch. A true substance is directed toward the ends that are characteristic of it in an intrinsic way, of its very nature, rather than merely by virtue of the purposes of some artificer. The technical Aristotelian Thomistic way of capturing this difference between a true su a physical substance and a mere aggregate or an artifact is to say that a physical substance has, a, has qua substance a substantial form, whereas an aggregate or an artifact has qua aggregate or artifact a merely accidental form. The mark of the things having a substantial form is the presence in it of irreducible properties and causal powers. Any example is bound to be controversial, but suppose for the sake of argument that water is a true substance and thus has qua water a substantial rather than merely accidental form. The idea would be that the properties and causal powers of water are irreducible to the properties and causal powers of hydrogen, oxygen, or a mere aggregate of hydrogen and oxygen. By contrast, uh, the properties and causal powers of a random pile of ice cubes made out of frozen water are reducible to the aggregate of the properties and powers of the cubes that make up the pile. And the properties and causal powers of an igloo constructed out of blocks of ice are reducible to the aggregate of the properties and powers of the blocks. Hence, to be a pile of ice cubes or an igloo is to have a merely accidental form rather than a substantial form. As these examples indicate, <clears throat> things with merely accidental forms presuppose the existence of things having substantial forms. You can't have random piles of ice cubes and igloos unless you first have frozen water. Hence, substances are metaphysically more fundamental than aggregates and artifacts. Now, I've brought up powers, so let's turn to those. A power is a capacity to act or operate in a certain way, such as acting on another thing so as to bring about a change in it. For example, frozen water or ice has the power to cool down the surrounding air. Now, a power is a kind of attribute, and like other attributes, it exists only in a substance rather than in a freestanding way. The power to cool down the surrounding air is a power of the ice. Strictly speaking, it is not the power to cool that cools down the air. It is rather the ice that cools down the air by virtue of having the power to do so. Moliere famously mocked this sort of talk as tautological or uninformative, but it is not. Consider his example of opium to which we can attribute a dormative power or a power to cause sleep. To attribute such a power to opium is not a tautology as it would be a tautology to say that opium causes sleep because it causes sleep. When we attribute such a power to opium, we are saying that there is something about the opium itself that produces sleep, that it is not something merely in the circumstances under which it is ingested that does so, even if the circumstances play some role. We are also saying that it is not merely something in some particular sample of opium that causes sleep, but rather something in the opium as such that does so. Of course, this is not the most informative claim in the world. We would also like to know exactly what it is about opium that gives it this effect, and a chemist might tell us that. But it really does give us at least some information about opium. 
Now, as my remarks have indicated, the powers of a physical substance are grounded in its substantial form. And different kinds of substance will have different powers as water and opium obviously do. Powers themselves differ insofar as they aim at or are directed toward different outcomes as being cooled and being made to sleep are different outcomes. This is to say powers have a kind of teleology. For the Aristotelian Thomistic metaphysician then, the notion of a causal power is closely related to the notions of formal and final causality. Indeed, a causal power is a kind of link or middleman between a substance's formal and final causes, its substantial form and its teleology. Aquinas tells us that, quote, every form has some inclination following upon it, and every agent acts for the sake of an end. That is to say, an agent or substance considered qua efficient cause will, by virtue of its distinctive form, be inclined toward and act to bring about some particular kind of end or ends. But a substance's form aims uh, it toward those ends through its causal powers, as it were. It is no surprise then that the abandonment by early modern philosophers of formal and final causes was associated with an abandonment of the notion of causal powers, at least for most of those thinkers. For post-Humean philosophy of causation, causes and effects are, as Hume puts it, loose and separate, precisely because no cause has a substantial form by virtue of which it naturally aims at the production of any particular sort of effect. Hence, if a certain kind of effect B happens in fact always to follow from a certain cause A, that must be attributed to some law of nature, extrinsic to A and B, rather than to some power intrinsic to A. This conceptual shift could hardly fail to have repercussions for how the will is conceived to relate to the agent whose will it is, and to the actions that follow upon the will's operation. Before we get to that, one last general point must be made about causal powers, which is that whether and how they operate depends crucially on circumstances. We must distinguish between a power and its manifestation on any particular occasion. A sample of opium has the power to cause sleep even if it's never ingested and thus never in fact causes sleep. Even if it's ingested, it may not cause sleep if this outcome is blocked by some other causal factor, say, by your having taken a handful of amphetamines before taking the opium. The manifestation of a causal power may depend on its operating in tandem with other causal powers, and also on the absence of the operation of yet other powers. As contemporary theorists of causal powers often point out, such facts have dramatic implications for our understanding of laws of nature. It's commonly assumed that laws of nature are fundamental to physical reality, and that at least the paradigmatic examples of laws operate in a strict or exceptionless way. But in fact, physical phenomena will exhibit the regularities described by a law of nature only given that certain causal powers are acting in tandem or failing to do so. And in some cases, this condition never actually holds. For example, Newton's first Law tells us that if not acted upon, an object in motion has a tendency to remain in motion forever. But objects never actually do remain in motion forever because all of them always are in fact acted upon by other objects. Hence the regularity described by the law never really holds. As this indicates, causal powers are actually more fundamental to physical reality than laws of nature are. A law is really just a description of how things will go if substances manifest their causal powers in such and such a way. As philosopher of science Nancy Cartwright famously put it, the laws of physics lie. They do not describe physical reality as it really is, but only some idealization of physical reality. Now, determinism is traditionally understood essentially presupposes a picture of the world on which the laws of nature are metaphysically fundamental and causal processes are secondary, operating in a way that conforms strictly to the laws. But this has things backwards. It is substances and their powers that are more fundamental and laws that are secondary, describing the patterns that will result if certain combinations of powers manifest or fail to manifest. Hence, determinism simply gets nature fundamentally wrong. Note that it is not only human beings that it gets wrong, but also non-human animals, plants, and inanimate phenomena. Since much of the modern debate about free will presupposes this deterministic picture of nature, from an Aristotelian Thomistic point of view, that debate simply gets off on the wrong foot and is largely irrelevant to the main issues. All right, so 
So much for substances in general. I know that you may, you may wonder, what does that have to do with free will? So let's finally turn to rational substances. We're getting closer to our target concept here. This is our next uh, section on rational substances. Again, the behavior of non-human animals is not deterministic, though it is also not random or arbitrary in the way that some events are, according to simple indeterminism. Yet non-human animals do not have wills, much less free will. So being non-determined also, but also non-random is not sufficient for having a will, free or otherwise. What more is needed? Aquinas' answer is that the will is a power of the kind of thing whose activity arises from within it in a certain way, specifically by way of having knowledge of the kind of which a rational substance alone is capable. To act voluntarily is to know what you were doing in the way that human beings and angels do, where an angel, of course, for Aquinas is just an immaterial mind, a, a mind without matter. But it will be useful before we give an account of what a rational substance is to say something about intermediate cases. Intermediate, that is to say, between inanimate things like opium and water on the one hand and human beings and angels on the other. A living thing is distinguished from non-living things in being self-perfecting. That is to say, in addition to having powers by which it affects other things, it also has powers to complete and maintain itself, as a plant does when it grows and takes in water and nutrients. In this thin sense, any living thing, including even a plant, can be said to be a kind of self-mover, and thus to act by virtue of something within it. The technical way of putting this is that it exhibits imminent causality as well as transient causality, to use some scholastic jargon. Still, a plant like water or opium does not know what it is doing and thus cannot be said to act voluntarily or from will. Now, though the behavior of non-human animals is not quite voluntary either, animals are closer than plants are to possessing the crucial characteristic that makes for will in a way that is instructive. Suppose I yank a plant from the ground or tie one of its branches back so that the leaves are kept permanently in the shade. Of course, no one will regard these movements of the plant as voluntary. The plant's natural tendencies would be to sink its roots into the ground and to grow toward the light. Being contrary to its natural tendencies, the movements I've caused in it are violent, and violent movements are ipso facto involuntary. But even when the plant does do what it's natural to, it wouldn't say that it acts voluntarily. It sinks its roots into the ground and it grows toward the light. But again, we would say that even then it doesn't know what it is doing. That is why we wouldn't blame a plant for failing to sink its roots into the ground or to grow toward the light. We would judge such a failure to be the result of the plants being afflicted by some sort of damage or disease rather than anything analogous to choice. We wouldn't say that the plant should know better because it doesn't know anything at all. And you have to know something before you can be held responsible. <clears throat> Again, for Aquinas, voluntary behavior is behavior that arises from within the agent in a certain specific way. The plant's roots being yanked from the ground is a movement that does not arise from within the plant in any sense, since in my example, I'm the one who makes them move that way. The plant's roots sinking into the ground is a movement that does arise from within the plant in a sense, since it results from the plant's natural self-perfective powers qua plant. However, though the power and inclination are in the plant, the end toward which the power is inclined is in no sense within the plant. And an end being present within an agent in, in some way is, Aquinas holds, a necessary condition for its behavior arising from within it in the relevant sense. Now, in a non-human animal, there is a sense in which the ends toward which its powers are inclined are within it. For an animal can perceive a thing toward which it is naturally inclined, such as the food that it eats. Even before it actually eats it, the food is in the animal qua perceived. Of course, an animal can misperceive things, as when a greyhound in a race chases a fake rabbit. But that reinforces the point that it is something, in a sense, internal to the animal, namely the end as perceived or misperceived, that moves it to act. A plant, by contrast, doesn't even rise to the level of misperception, let alone of perception. So unlike a plant, an animal has a kind of knowledge of the end it is pursuing. However, we still wouldn't say that an animal knows what it is doing, and thus we wouldn't hold it morally responsible for what it does any more than we would hold a plant morally responsible. For while the animal knows the end that it pursues, it doesn't know that it knows it. It doesn't know the end as an end, for it does not have the concept of an end, nor indeed any concepts at all. Hence, it also lacks the concept of being a means to an end, 
and thus doesn't know that, it, that its action is a means to the end that it pursues, much less that other means might be possible. This lack of concepts entails a certain inflexibility in the animal's behavior. Like a plant, an animal cannot do otherwise than whatever, in fact, it does. If the animal is hungry and there are no countervailing circumstances present, such as a predator's being in the vicinity of the food and frightening the animal away, the animal's perception of the food will result in it trying to eat it. Because of this lack of concepts and consequent inflexibility in its behavior, Aquinas says that a non-human animal acts voluntarily only in an imperfect sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, a rational substance is a substance with an intellect, and to have an intellect is precisely to have the capacity to conceptualize what one knows. A human being, qua rational animal, not only knows the food that he tries to eat, but he knows it as food and as something that would be good for him to eat given his need for nutrition. He also knows that biting into it straight away would be one possible means of eating it, and that this has certain advantages and disadvantages compared to other means, such as baking it into a pie, turning it into applesauce or squeezing the juice out and drinking it. Hence, when he eats the apple, he knows what he is doing in a way that opium or a plant or a non-human animal does not know what it is doing. He's able to know this because the end toward which he is inclined is within him in a more perfect way than a non-human animal's ends are within it. In particular, his having a concept of the thing toward which he is inclined entails having the form or essence of that thing in his intellect abstracted from the matter in which that former essence is embedded in the thing itself. For example, when he knows the apple as something that would be good to eat, the former essence of the apple, appleness, if you will, is in his intellect, abstracted from the matter in which appleness, if you'll pardon that barbarism, is embedded in this or that particular apple. And for an agent to have within it the very essence of the thing toward which it is inclined is to have that end within it in a more perfect way than merely to have a perceptual representation of that end as a non-human animal does. We have then a hierarchy of degrees to which the source of a thing's behavior is within it. Inanimate things like frozen water and opium have causal powers which are directed towards certain ends. For example, cooling down the surrounding air and causing sleep respectively. But these ends are entirely external to the inanimate things themselves. Merely vegetative forms of life have powers directed toward ends internal to them, such as growth, but without any sort of knowledge of these ends. Given their inherent directedness toward an end, the powers of these animate and inanimate non-sentient substances can be thought of as appetites of a sort, but as merely natural appetites, to use the Aristotelian scholastic jargon, insofar as they reflect the thing's natural tendencies rather than any sort of knowledge. Since a non-human animal has the ends toward which it, its powers are directed within it by virtue of perceptually representing them, it, it does have a kind of knowledge, albeit an imperfect kind. Its powers are classified as sensory appetites. A rational substance, such as a human being or an angel, has a perfect knowledge of the ends toward which its powers are directed, insofar as the very essences of those ends are within it. The ends toward which its powers are directed are within it in the most perfect possible way and thus its activity arises from within in the most perfect possible way. It possesses a kind of causal power which we can classify as rational appetite. To have a will is for Aquinas precisely to have a rational appetite, to have in the most perfect way possible the source of one's activity within one. Having a will thus entails being a rational substance, and to be a rational substance entails having a will, because every kind of substance has its own distinctive causal powers. And a will just is the kind of appetite or power or characteristic of a rational substance. Now notice that having a will also entails immateriality, but that the reason has nothing to do with a Cartesian res cogitans throwing a monkey wrench into otherwise deterministic material processes. It has to do instead with possessing forms abstracted from matter. Non-human animals do this in a loose sense, which is why Aquinas is willing to say that there is an imperfect sense in which they act voluntarily. For example, when such an animal sees an apple, the redness, roundness, etc., of the apple are captured into visual experience, whereas the interior of the apple, its weight, solidity, etc., are not captured. By capturing the former without the latter, the animal's visual experience involves a kind of dematerialization, if you will. 
it pulls the forms, redness, roundness, etc., from the apple so that they exist qua, uh, as qualia of conscious experience rather than in the apple itself, while leaving behind the rest of the apple, as it were. But this is not a strict dematerialization any more than is the dematerialization accomplished by a photorealistic still life painting of the apple, which also captures the color, shape, etc., without capturing the interior of the apple, its weight, solidity, etc. For just as the painting is itself embodied in canvas and paint, which are material, so too is the perceptual experience embodied in physiological activity, which is also material. By contrast, the forms or essences abstracted by the intellect of a rational animal are immaterial in a strict sense because they are universal rather than particular and material things are always particular. Now the immateriality of the intellect is a large topic calling for a treatment of its own. Suffice it for present purposes to say that its immateriality is by no means incidental to the nature of the will uh, that is the distinctive power of a rational substance. As we'll see later on, it has dramatic implications for the nature of the will. All right, now I'm going to skip the next section on voluntarism and jump to section five on freedom of choice. As previously indicated, I'm going to grab a little drink of water here as well. So we turn to freedom of choice. Modern discussions of free will often identify two conditions, one or both of which are taken to be necessary and sufficient for an agent's acting freely. First, that the agent is the source of his own actions. Second, that the agent could have acted otherwise than he does. As Tobias Hoffman and Peter Furlong note in a recent article, Aquinas also takes these two conditions to be necessary and sufficient for free choice, but he doesn't regard them as independent. As I've said, for Aquinas to have a will is to be the source of one's own activity in the fullest possible way, which entails acting from intellectual knowledge as opposed to acting from natural appetite or from mere sensory knowledge. And that is also in his view what it is to have freedom of choice. The ability to do otherwise is a byproduct of this. Now we'll come back to that, but let's begin by noting that what freedom does not entail is the will's utter indifference to the ends toward which it might aim. Like every other substance, a rational substance is of its nature directed toward some ultimate end. And that end is its happiness, which is the realization of what is good for it. Qua rational, this substance is capable of knowing this end intellectually, and the will or rational appetite is aimed at this end as grasped by the intellect. A will that was not of its nature directed toward what the intellect takes to be good would be like an acorn that was not of its nature directed toward becoming an oak. The latter just wouldn't really be an acorn and the former just wouldn't really be a will. We have a kind of necessity here which Aquinas calls natural necessity since it has to do with what a thing cannot not do, cannot not do given its nature or essence. This contrasts with what he calls the necessity of coercion which has to do with the things being forced to do what is contrary to its natural tendencies. As when I imagine tying a, a plant's branches back so that its leaves were kept in the shade. Obviously, necessity of coercion is incompatible with freedom of choice, since it would involve forcing a rational substance to do something contrary to what its intellect takes to be good, and thus contrary to what it wills. But natural necessity is not contrary to freedom of choice. On the contrary, just as you might say that a plant is more free if I do not tie its branches back, that is to say, if I let it do what it wants to do, what it cannot help aiming to do, given the kind of thing it is, so too a will is more free if it is not prevented from doing what it cannot help doing, given the kind of thing that it is, namely pursuing what the intellect takes to be good. A tree that did not aim at getting its branches toward the sun would not be a freer tree, but just a defective tree. And a will that did not aim at the good would not be a freer will, but just a, def just a defective will. Now, Aquinas distinguishes a third kind of necessity, which perhaps somewhat confusingly, he calls necessity of the end. The reference here is not to the ultimate end, which as I've said is happiness, the realization of what is in fact good for a rational substance. It is rather to what is perceived to be good or to the means by which the good might be attained. Now, the intellect can be mistaken about what is in fact good, and it might note that several different means to attaining what it takes to be good are possible. 
In that sense, it is not necessitated toward the ends that it pursues. Necessity of the end in the present sense would exist if the intellect had such a penetrating grasp of what is in fact good, but it could not not perceive it to be good. Or if there were no possible means of attaining the good other than the one the intellect takes to be a means. In this sort of situation, the will cannot will otherwise. Importantly for Aquinas, this kind of necessity, like natural necessity, is not contrary to the will's nature and thus not contrary to freedom. This is why I say that for Aquinas, ability to do otherwise is a byproduct of acting from intellectual knowledge, where I would argue the latter is what you might call the essence of freedom, and the former, namely ability to do otherwise, is a property or proper accident of acting from intellectual knowledge to use some more scholastic jargon. The basic idea is that knowing things intellectually entails bringing them under concepts. And there are always different ways that the same things can be conceptualized or brought under concepts. As Elizabeth Anscombe notes in a slightly different context, quote, <clears throat> a man may know that he is doing a thing under one description and not under another, unquote. And there are always alternative possible descriptions under which we might know a thing or an action. As John Haldane writes, quote, to think of an item is always to think of it via some conception. For any naturally individuated object or property, there are indefinitely many non-equivalent ways of thinking about it. That is to say, the structure of the conceptual order, which is expressed in judgments and actions, is richer and more abstract than that of the natural order, unquote. Or if I can borrow one more set of phrases, this time from Wilfred Sellers by way of John McDowell, the idea is that the intellect always brings things into, quote, the logical space of reasons, unquote, of which the conceptual order is a part. And that space is wider than the, quote, space of causes, unquote, into which our behavior and the objects we interact with also fall. They're like apples and oranges, space of reasons, space of causes. Hence, since the intellect can in principle conceptualize or describe things in different ways, and thus depending on the conceptualization or description, judge the very same things either as a good end or the best means, or judge them instead, uh, judge instead that some other end or means is better, it follows that the agent could in principle either will or not will the same end or means. Thus, he has the ability to do otherwise just as a consequence of having an intellect, which in its nature can always conceptualize in alternative ways. Non-human animals and inanimate things lack this ability to do otherwise precisely because they do not bring things under concepts and therefore don't have alternative ways of conceptualizing things and the flexibility of action that that entails. Now, this gives us a way to understand the role of circumstances in choice and action. Recall that I said that whether and how the causal powers of a substance will manifest depends crucially on context, and in particular on which of the causal powers of other things are either manifesting or not manifesting. This, you will also recall, is why it is a mistake to think of laws of nature as the fundamental level of physical reality. Laws of nature are instead a description of the way things go if there obtains a typically idealized situation in which substances and their powers are operating in tandem in a certain specific way. Hence determinism, which presupposes that laws of nature are fundamental and describe the way things always actually do, always actually go rather, just gets nature wrong. However, that does not entail that there's no necessitation in nature. On the contrary, though the idealized situation described by a law may not in fact obtain, if it obtains, then things really will go the way that the law says they will. That is why it is possible to discover at least idealized laws of nature. But though this is true of the order of inanimate things and plants and non-human animals, it is not true of rational substances like human beings. For the context in which our causal powers operate does not include merely the other substances together with their powers with which we may interact. It includes also the way we actually conceptualize all of this other context, and again, there are always alternative ways we might conceptualize it. Whatever particular conceptualization we adopt is part of what governs how we act. But because there is nothing in the intellect as such that entails that one conceptualization rather than another will prevail, there is nothing that necessitates a particular outcome. The way that a certain outcome will be necessitated when non-human physical substances and their powers interact in just the right way. This is why there are not and cannot be laws of human action the way that there are laws of physics and of chemistry. 
that the conceptual order outstrips the natural order forbids that. This is the thesis of the anomalism of the mental famously argued for by Donald Davidson, though he did not do so in the Aristotelian Thomistic way that I've been doing. <clears throat> he was, I would say, essentially reinventing the Aristotelian Thomistic wheel, perhaps under the influence of Elizabeth Anscombe's book, Intention. A conclusion that Davidson does not draw from this, but should have, as Thomists like Haldane do, is that the conceptual order and the intellect in which it resides are immaterial. For given the different ways in which the same physical facts might be conceptualized, the entirety of the physical facts is insufficient to determine or to fix the content of the conceptual facts. But as I've said, the immateriality of the intellect is a topic that would need a separate treatment of its own. Suffice it for present purposes to note that the way that the intellect and will relate to bodily behavior is not by virtue of being an eccentric set of efficient causes that in some mysterious way interact with physiological processes. Consider the action of my typing up an academic paper, like the one I'm reading here, that my intellect conceptualizes what I'm doing in just that particular way is the formal cause of the action. The end or goal of typing up the paper toward which my will is directed is the final cause. And the relevant bodily processes are the material and efficient causes. I am a single substance of which these four irreducibly different causal factors, some of them corporeal and some incorporeal, are aspects. It is an error and certainly at best a tendentious assumption that the Aristotelian Thomistic philosopher would reject to suppose that all of this must somehow be replaceable by a description couched in terms acceptable to the philosophical naturalist. Aquinas offers an argument for the reality of free choice. It goes like this, quote, man has free choice. Otherwise, deliberations, exhortations, precepts, prohibitions, rewards, and punishments would make no sense, unquote. Now, you might think that what he's doing here is really just giving an argument for why it would be horrible if free choice were an illusion, insofar as the basic presupposition of morality and related practices would, in that case, be undermined. As, and you may go on to point out that this doesn't really show that free choice is real, but merely gives us a motivation for wanting it to be real. But I don't think that it was Aquinas's argument at all. I think that what he is saying is that it is simply a datum that our practices of deliberating, exhorting, and so forth do in fact make sense. If anyone doubted this, I imagine that in response, he might offer a retorsion argument to the effect that such doubt is on analysis incoherent that one has actually to engage in deliberation and the like precisely in the act of trying to justify one's denial of it. Now, if this datum makes sense only on the assumption that we have free choice, then Aquinas concludes we must have free choice. Aquinas elaborates as follows, and here's a longer quote. Now, a man acts by judgment since through his cognitive power, he judges that something should be pursued or avoided. But the reason why he acts by free judgment and is able to go in alternative ways is that in the case of a particular action, this judgment arises from a comparison made by reason and not from natural instinct. But with respect to contingent matters, reason has an openness with respect to opposites, as is clear from dialectical syllogisms and rhetorical persuasions. But particular actions are contingent matters, and so with respect to them, the judgment of reason is related to different alternatives and is not determined to just one. Accordingly, by the very fact that he is rational, man must have free choice, unquote. Okay, that was all Aquinas. Aquinas's reference to reason's openness with respect to opposites and to its being related to different alternatives and not determined to just one is, I would suggest, an appeal precisely to the slack that I have said holds between the conceptual order on the one hand and the order of things conceptualized on the other. There to be such slack just is what it is for a choice to be free. Because the intellect is not necessitated to conceptualizing things one way rather than the other, the will is not necessitated to one end rather than the other. But neither is choice random or arbitrary the way it would be if simple indeterminism were true. Choice is always for a reason, even if the reason is not necessitated. And to act for a reason is precisely not to act randomly or arbitrarily. Okay, so the determinism or randomness choice is a false choice. All right, that ends uh, the section on the freedom of the will. And so let me finally turn in our last few minutes of the talk here to the question of the post-mortem fixity of the will, our final section. So this brings us at last to the thesis that the wills of the saved and of the damned are perpetually fixed on good or evil respectively. 
which entails a qualification of what I've been saying about the possibility of conceptualizing things differently. Let's first consider why the will is fixed after death and then return later to the question of how this can be reconciled with freedom. It will be useful to begin by considering Aquinas's account of the way in which an angel is either saved or damned. Like us, angels choose what they choose under the guise of the good, that is to say, because they take it to be good in some way. And as with us, an angel's ultimate good is in fact God. But, again like us, angels can come to be mistaken about what the ultimate good is. An angel can erroneously take something other than God to be its ultimate good. However, the nature of this error in the case of an angel is somewhat different uh, from the nature of the error that we might commit. In us, a sudden and fleeting passion might distract us from what is truly good for us and lead us to pursue something uh, other instead. The passions are essentially corporeal. They exist only in creatures which, like us, have bodies. Angels do not have bodies, and so passions play no role in leading them into error. The second way we can be led into error is through the influence of a bad habit, which pulls us away from what is truly good for us in a more serious way than a fleeting passion might. For Aquinas, there is habituation in angels, as there is in us. However, there is a difference. In our case, several appetites pull us in different directions because of our corporeal nature. Because we are rational animals, our will is directed at what the intellect takes to be good. But because we are rational animals, we also have appetites which move us toward the pursuit of other sub-intellectual things, such as food, sexual intercourse, and so forth. These appetites compete for dominance, as it were, which is why in a human being, even a deeply ingrained habit can be overcome if a competing appetite is strong enough to counter it. Angels are not like this because they are incorporeal. They have only a single appetite. The will is directed toward what the intellect takes to be good. There is no competing appetite that can pull the angel away from this uh, once the will is directed toward it, away from this end. Once the will is so directed, habituation follows immediately and unchangeably because the lack of any other appetite that might pull an angel, because of the lack of any other appetite that might pull an angel into some different direction. A third way we can be led into error, we human beings, is intellectually, by virtue of simply being factually mistaken about what is in fact good for us. Here too, angels can make the same sort of error, but here too, the nature of the error is different in their case. <clears throat> the way we come to know things is discursively. We gather evidence, we weigh it, we reason from premises to conclusion, and so on. All of this follows upon our corporeality, the way we rely on sensory experience of particular things in order to begin the process of working up to general conclusions, the way we make use of mental imagery as an aid to thought, and so forth. Error creeps in because passion or habituation interferes with the proper functioning of these cognitive processes or because we get the facts wrong somewhere in the premises that we reason from or the like. Further inquiry can correct the error. There's nothing like this in angels. For Aquinas, an angel knows what it knows, not discursively, but immediately. It doesn't reason from first principles to conclusions, for example, but it knows the first principles and what follows from them all at once in a single act. Now, because there's no cognitive process by which an angel knows, as there is in us, there's no correction of a cognitive process that has, been, that has gone wrong, either by gathering new information or resisting passions or overcoming bad habits. If an angel goes wrong at all, it is not, as we are, merely moving in an erroneous direction where this trajectory might be reversed. It simply is wrong and stays wrong. For Aquinas, then, an angel's basic orientation is set immediately after its creation. It either rightly takes God for its ultimate end, or it wrongly takes something less than God for its ultimate end. If the former, then it's forever locked on to beatitude, and if the latter, it's forever locked on to unhappiness. There's no contrary appetite that can move it away from what it is habituated to, and no cognitive process that can be redirected. The angel that chooses wrongly is thus fallen or damned, and not even God can change that anymore and he can make a round square. For such change is simply metaphysically impossible insofar as it is contrary to the very nature of an angelic intellect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, human beings are different because they are corporeal. Or to be more precise, they are different while they are corporeal. For a human being has both corporeal and incorporeal faculties. When the body goes, the corporeal faculties go. But the incorporeal faculties, intellect and will, the same faculties that an angel has, carry on, and the human being persists as an incomplete substance. 
This brings us to Aquinas' treatment of the changeability or lack thereof of the human will. Prior to death, it is always possible for the human will to correct course for the reasons described above. A passion inclining one to evil can be overcome. A bad habit can be counteracted by a contrary appetite. A new knowledge might be acquired by which an erroneous judgment can be revised. Hence, at any time before death, there is at least some hope that damnation can be avoided. But after death, Aquinas argues things are different. At death, the soul is separated from the body, a separation which involves the intellect and the will, which were never corporeal faculties in the first place, carrying on without the corporeal faculties that influence their operation during life. In effect, the soul now operates in all relevant respects the way an angelic intellect does. Just as an angel immediately after its creation either takes God as its ultimate end or something less than God as its ultimate end, so too does the disembodied human soul make the same choice, or to be more precise, is confirmed in the last choice it made prior to death, immediately upon death. And just as the angel's choice is irreversible given that the corporeal preconditions of a change are absent, so too is the newly disembodied soul's choice irreversible and for the same reason. The corporeal preconditions of a change of orientation toward an ultimate good, which were present in life, uh, are now gone. Hence, the soul which opts for God as its ultimate end is locked onto that end forever, and the soul which opts instead for something less than God is locked on to that forever. The former soul enjoys eternal beatitude, and the latter suffers eternal separation from God in, or damnation. The only way a change could be made is if the soul could come to judge something else instead as a higher end or good than what it has opted for, but it cannot do so. Being disembodied, it lacks any passions that could sway it from this choice. It also, like an angel, now lacks any competing appetite which might pull its will away from the end that it has chosen. Thus, it is immediately habituated to aiming toward whatever following death it opted for as its highest end or good, or put better, at the moment of death it was opting for as its highest end or good, whether God or something less than God. Nor is there any new knowledge which might change its course since now lacking sensation and imagination and everything that goes with them, it does not know discursively, but rather in an all at once way, in an all at once way as an angel does. There is no longer any cognitive process whose direction might be corrected. Now you might ask, might not the resurrection of the body restore the possibility of a course correction? But Aquinas answers in the negative, and I think he was right to do so. The nature of the resurrection body is necessarily tailored to the nature of the soul to which it is conjoined. And that soul is now locked on to whatever end it opted for upon death. The soul prior to death was capable of changing its basic orientation only because it came into existence with its body and thus never had a chance to set, as it were. But once it does set, nothing can alter its orientation again. An analogy may help. Consider wet clay, which is being molded into a pot. As long as it remains wet, it can alter its basic shape. But once it's dried in a furnace, it's locked into the shape it had while in the furnace. Putting it in water once again wouldn't somehow make it malleable again. Indeed, the water would now be forced to conform itself to the shape of the pot rather than vice versa. Now, the soul is like that. While together with the body during life, it's like wet clay. Death locks it into one basic orientation or another, just as the furnace locks the clay into a certain definite shape. The restoration of the body cannot change its basic orientation again any more than wetting down a pot or filling it with water can make it malleable again. Now, the fixity of angelic wills and the fixity after death of the human will are, in Aquinas' view, consistent with free choice. Remember that, in Aquinas' view, an action's being voluntary is consistent with what he calls the necessity of the end, which involves factors such as an intellect being unable not to perceive something to be good, uh, or there being only one possible means to attain some good. If I simply cannot possibly get across the room except by moving through space, since there's no teleportation, or I cannot possibly get myself to doubt that one and one makes two, it doesn't follow that my walking across the room and, and affirming that one plus one makes two are not really freely chosen acts. The acts of angels and of souls after death are like this in Aquinas' view. They can't help either seeing that God is the highest good or failing to see this, and thus cannot help either loving God above all things or failing to do so. But, and here's the crucial point, there's nothing either external to them or in their own natures that necessitated this outcome. 
No one and no thing outside them coerce them into either final beatitude or into impenitence. But nothing in their nature as rational substances necessitated either outcome either. They could have chosen either and ended up choosing one rather than the other. Nor was this some random or arbitrary outcome, since, again, they made whatever final choice they did for a reason. So any of the factors that may make something unfree are absent on this account. Recall that I suggested that on Aquinas' account, the essence of freedom is the agents being the source of his own activity in the fullest possible way. And that ability to do otherwise is something like a property or proper accident that flows from this essence rather than itself being the essence. This, I propose, gives us one way to understand Aquinas' view that freedom is consistent with the fixity of the will after death. An angel and soul after death remain the source of its own activity in the fullest possible way and thus remain free, even if in the most crucial choice, the choice of ultimate end, it no longer has the ability to choose, to choose otherwise. We might think of the ability to choose otherwise with respect to one's ultimate end as a proper accident of the kind that has only a provisional status, like a butterfly's caterpillar stage. A butterfly, given its nature or essence, will necessarily manifest caterpillar attributes, but only provisionally. And an angel or a human soul, given its nature or essence, will necessarily manifest the ability to choose otherwise with respect to its ultimate end, but here too only provisionally. Now, just to wrap things up before we have a little bit of Q&A, one might wonder whether this position amounts to a compatibilist theory of free will. And I would answer that it most certainly does not. For one thing, compatibilism holds that freedom is consistent with determinism. And I've already explained why the Aristotelian Thomistic position regards determinism as a wrong-headed conception of the natural world. So reconciling freedom with determinism is simply not the sort of project that a thinker like Aquinas has in view. For another thing, precisely because of its determinism, compatibilism makes something outside of the agent, namely the laws of nature, together with the state of the universe prior to the agent's existence, the source of his activity. And that conflicts with what I've said is Aquinas' account, Aquinas's account of the essence of free choice as arising from within the agent. Is Aquinas' view of free choice libertarian then? Well, as Eleanor Stump notes in her book on Aquinas, this depends on how one understands libertarianism. If libertarian free will is taken to entail the ability to do otherwise without qualification, for example, without a qualification that would make free choice consistent with the will's fixity after death, then Aquinas' account is not libertarian. But Stump seems to think that a view according to which it is sufficient for freedom that an action originate in the intellect and will of the agent could reasonably be construed as a version of libertarianism. And on this construal, Aquinas' account would be libertarian. Perhaps the issue is, at the end of the day, semantic. I would simply point out that participants on all sides of the contemporary debate about free will, compatibilism, and libertarianism usually make philosophical assumptions that Aquinas would reject. Hence, it is not easy to situate Aquinas' position within that debate, and trying to do so can threaten to obscure his position as much as it might illuminate it. Uh, as much as it might illuminate it. Okay, and so with that, I'll end. And uh, Father Ephra Ephraim, if you wanted to uh, turn now to Q and A uh, and maybe take a question or two, as I grab some water. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Fazer for an excellent lecture. Uh, you got a lot of positive feedback from our, our viewers who also expressed uh, gratitude for all your books. And one thing that uh, got a lot of interest in particular was your discussion about animals as a kind of intermediate sort of being between uh, the inanimate and the, uh, the human, the rational. Yeah. So there are a lot of questions about our knowledge about animals and how Particularly, do we know that they don't have will, that they don't know concepts? So a lot of, you know, how can we know from examining a chimpanzee that it doesn't have a will, for instance? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a good question. It's a large question. What I would say is that the typical mark of rationality, and this is, I think this would be, this would be something accepted both by Thomas and others in the classical tradition like Plato and Aristotle, but also by moderns, you know, including Alan Turing, who famously in his Turing test sees the language use as the mark of intelligence. Language would be the typical mark of intelligence, and whereby language, I don't just mean 
the signaling that, that many non-human animals are capable of, but the sort of institution that is the kind of structure and the kind of rules and, and, uh, uh, and properties that are studied by linguists and studied by logicians and so forth. That's really the, the benchmark of, uh, or the, the, um, the hallmark, I should say, of intellect, of intelligence in the sense in which I'm, uh, that I'm talking about here. And almost every non-human animal clearly lacks that. Certainly if they have it, they're being extremely shy. You know, if dogs or birds have intelligence in the sense that it's manifest in language of the kind of uh, concept expressing sort that we have, they don't exhibit any behavior that, that manifests that. And, you know, as Aristotle and Aquinas would argue, if something has a certain feature, then if you give it enough time and put it under a, a wide enough variety of circumstances, it's going to manifest that feature. And dogs and birds never manifest language use of that type. And so we can safely assume they don't have intelligence. Now, apes are sometimes said to manifest that under certain highly artificial circumstances, but um, you know, they, they're said to manifest something, you know, kind of sort of roughly like human language, at least uh, sign language. Uh, but I don't, <clears throat> I don't find those sorts of examples plausible for the same sort of reason that Noam Chomsky doesn't. Norm, Noam Chomsky argues, I think he's quite right about this, that to say that, you know, if you get an ape in a highly artificial condition, a highly artificial circumstance where the ape kind of sort of looks as if, if you kind of squint at its sort of doing something like human language. Therefore, apes are, have the sort of language and rationality we have. That's like saying that if under highly artificial conditions, you can get a dog to jump really, really high, that you've shown that dogs fly just like birds do. It, it's ridiculous. You're taking what's really only a, a very superficial similarity under highly artificial circumstances as a mark of, of true intelligence. And, and so... Uh, so I don't think there's any good evidence that non-human animals really have intelligence. But if there were, I mean, if you could show that there were uh, at least what seemed initially to be non-human animals that really had intelligence that like we have, because they really do have concepts expressed in language like we do, if it turned out that apes really had it, then I would say, okay, I guess that they're rational animals after all. They're, in a sense, they're an eccentric sort of human after all, in which case they would have the free choice that follows upon that. I don't think, in fact, they do. But if you could show they did, then I think I think Thomas would, and certainly I would, would just bite the bullet and say, I, I guess they've got a rudimentary sort of intellect. But I, I don't think that's that's plausible.